lot. Um, and, you know, it's a very interesting discussion that him and I have, and Dr. Gatson is smiling. So, Dr. Gatson, I'm not sure whose side I'm arguing on today, but we'll find out in the end if it's my side or his side. But nonetheless, thank you, Pastor. <laughs> This, no, no, we, we, we are, everybody's on the Lord's side. Well, this, arguing, this, arguing. Oh, yeah, air yeah, quotes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Air yeah, quotes, yeah. forgot oh, yeah. the air quotes, arguing. Yeah. But nonetheless, thank you for the opportunity um, to speak to the people of Turner, the family of Turner on this Wednesday um, as we deal with chapter six. So, and Colonel Hollis, uh, Chaplain Hollis had mentioned in her prayer, and that basically deals with when we are dealing with um, program strategies, events, and things of that nature, we must first start by uh, with the understanding of the vision and the mission of the if we remember when pastor had those focus groups not too long ago in August, that was one of the questions he posed to these focus groups is who knew the vision and the mission of Turner Memorial? Because if you don't know the vision and the mission, and you're supposed to plan programs and strategies that align with said vision and said mission, you don't know it, it, it becomes a very blurry space. So the vision of Turner Memorial is that of the Andy Church, which is to build people for God's kingdom through the preaching of the gospel, the feeding of the hungry, the clothing of the naked, providing homes to the homeless, jobs for the jobless, and uplift for the fallen. But our vision is that which is unique to Turner. And it explains how Turner will execute and achieve the vision, the mission. And our vision specifically is through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we will, we being Turner, will thrive, transform, and train God's people to go bear fruit that will last. So we can use different strategies that articulate our vision to attract those that can enhance and receive our visions. Our strategies can be different than the place down the street because we have a different vision. Thusly, we have, we're trying to attract different people, a different population and things of that nature. Fellowship activities that foster camaraderie, positive experiences amongst members, which can overflow to persons developing relationships and positive banter about the church, et cetera. That's a model of a thriving church, which is one of the components of our vision. A thriving church, a transforming church, a training church. When we're all of those different components, when all those different components are achieved and in place, that is when we will build bear fruit that will last. So specifically for everyone this meeting today, this session today, when you look at the stuff your specific ministry does or things you have in mind that you would like to see the ministry of Turner do is your strategy, is your ministry, is your program, is your activity, is your event, is it thriving, is it training, or is it transforming God's people? And that's a real question. Well, let me add, can I, is that open to yeah. answer? Okay. Um, I'm, you know, uh, haven't been at Turner for a long time, but um, blessed to be over the congregational care. And um, I am finding that um, I, I, I need to develop a strategy uh, because there are so many lists out there. Uh, and there, there, there's the official list, and then there's the, uh, you know, that's on this written in the uh, bulletin. And then I get, you know, phone calls. Uh, so I have been thinking um, about a uh, uh, strategy to encourage uh, um, the individuals that are not on the written bulletin uh, uh, to 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 uh, get their name on there because it, it will not just make my life a little easier. Um, but um, I just want to find out this a, a strategy that will encourage them uh, that Turner is concerned and we do pray and other people uh, are are interested in the well fair of our members that's all awesome no that's awesome thank you so much for um sharing chaplain hollis reverend 
Reverend Hollis, about developing a strategy that will help streamline specifically your your ministry activities, your ministry um, focus, and your ministry work. Um, and, and to her point, using kind of what she said, strategies are changing and they're evolving and they're dynamic. So if we use the example that Reverend Hollis gave, you know, back in the day, we use the lists and some people don't want to be on the list. They don't want their name in a bulletin. But back in the day, you know, some people, and I have to say it like I say it, thrives on having their name in the bulletin. And some people are not that public. They want to be more private. So we have to, as she is doing, finding ways to make sure she is connecting to those people who are um, sick and shut in but not just sticking with the old traditional methods and traditional is probably not the right word, but evolving and dynamic things. So when we are aligning our strategic thinking, thinking about strategies, this includes aligning our assets and our passions with needs and needs of that of the community. So when we think of Turner, what would you guys say is our community? What, who, what is our community? Because in order to meet the needs of the community, we have to know what the community is. So what would you guys say is the community? And that too is a real question. Or who do you feel it is or who should it be? Well, um, in, in, in uh, church studies, they, um, they share that your, if you will, your fishing pond, if you will, um, using that kind of an analogy, is really uh, within a five to 10 mile radius uh, of the church. Um, because in studies they show, and I know that we have people at Turner who travel well beyond uh, five and 10 miles uh, to come into service, but they share that your average individual only travels that amount of distance uh, as you know to attend a church service. So I would say our fishing pond, our community is uh, a five to 10 mile radius of, um, of where the church is located. That passed the answer too, uh, too quick because I was gonna give his answer uh, <laughs> that according to what our pastor has taught <laughs> us, <laughs> that it is, you know, that radius. And so um, I guess I would also add, and I'm hesitant to add this, but I'm going to go ahead and add, um, I, I sort of look at church like through three levels of community. So the five to 10 mile radius um, fishing pond that um, pastor has trained us to address. Of course, the church congregation itself. And that's the part that I was hesitant to add because um, a church that is just serving itself is really just a country club. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but I think it's important to include that because part of being the church is making space for, or, or having a response for those who are not thriving among us and in that five to 10 mile radius. And then I would also say that at times it gets broadened um, to the level of societal concerns wherever God has called us to have a response. Like I remember a few years back, um, uh, Pastor led us into, uh, I think we shipped water and supplies and, and those kinds of things in response to um, the hurricanes and all of that kind of stuff. So what kind Your of issue in Flint? Yes. And <laughs> water was the issue in Flint. And then there was um, the diapers and all of that kind of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think I think of community on those three levels, because it, at least by the time that I have been at Turner, um, we have been called to respond on those three levels. No, thank you. Uh, sorry. Yeah. It's it's interesting. Thank you. Um, because I was as Dr. Gadsden was speaking, there I, I don't I don't want to say a debate, but there is this, if you will, tension. That's I think that might be an appropriate word. There's this tension between um the congregation and the community and who 
what services or ministry uh, should the church gear it to, to the congregation or to the community? And I, I was, I started, so Shandell, everyone else, I started to think about like, if you will, the model of Jesus, right? Because he had some disciples who all intents and purposes probably needed ministering to just like the blind man, just like the brother at the pool of Bethesda, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, but as I think about it, and I was saying like, well, how did Jesus handle that? How did Jesus handle both ministering to the disciples and also um, ministering to those who were not his disciple. And it just dawned on me in the midst of her talking as I was giving some thought to it is in all actuality, Sister Moore, Jesus used the experience of the community to help the disciples. I, I, I want to say that again. Jesus used the ministry to the community, to the individual, because we hear, we see in stories where uh, the disciples came back to Jesus and said, why weren't we able to do that? Or what did you mean when you said this? And uh, why did this happen? And stuff of that nature is that when you look at the model of Jesus and how he both ministered to those, if you will, within the upper room and those outside of the upper room, is the fact that he used the experience of those outside the upper room to bring about growth to those inside. The, 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 do y'all see that? Now, in order, so if we look at Jesus' model, it's almost as if we, it, it's almost as if we have to not so well. We should <laughs> uh, go out and focus on those whom are not and use what we and come back and share those experiences so that then internally we can we can grow ourselves it's like creating a win-win situation that's it okay so feeding off of what kind of pastor just said and the fact that you know our community is external and so I want to drill down a little bit more, right? Because when you're trying to align specific strategies to your vision, five mile radius is really broad, right? It's it's really broad. It's a lot in that five mile radius. And you have to, and I'm not I'm not just talking about the the breadth of it all, but like you have different facets of stuff, people, that's a better word, people. In that in that population, so we can and and everyone has different needs in that population. And if you're trying to meet all those needs of everyone in that five mile, you're going to be running around and not accomplishing anything, right? So it, within that five mile radius, who would you guys say? Um, going back to that same that same phrase that I started with, aligning our strategic thinking to the mission, to the vision, which means aligning our assets, our passions, and our passions with the needs of the community. So in order to figure all this out, we have to kind of back into this question. We have to figure out what are the needs of, who is the community? What are the needs of the community? And then what are our assets? And then once we get all those different pieces together, that's how we can get things aligned in our vision to our vision we can't align stuff that we don't know we have or we don't have you're you're going to be wasting your time so within that five mile community who would you guys say is the um, the target audience right and this is this is it could be everybody y'all can say everybody i don't really don't I hear you say everybody but is it families is it seniors is it young people is it professionals is it those that you know have never been church who if we look at that five mile radius who would you guys say like if someone had to say in that five mile radius, who are you targeting? Who, what would you guys say? That's a real question. So I, I guess being where the church is at, I know we have a very diverse group of people around the church, but I know it's predominantly Hispanic. Um, 
And I know pastors talked about it before, which is why, um, you know, we have uh, the Spanish church downstairs, uh, Mount Hor. But I would like to say everybody, but I feel like it, it probably might lean more towards those on the on the Hispanic side and probably a little bit more. And I think we have a lot of people like from like African cultures also around the way. So I guess that's my that's my answer. No, thanks, Joey. No, that's 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 good stuff. So we have a we have an answer for the Latino community and the those that um are from the African from African countries and out the international community. I'll just kind of lump Joey, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but the international You're good. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the international community, Caribbean, uh Latino, you know, anyone else who who would you say your and think about your ministries? Who is your target target audience? Because if you don't know who your target audience is, then if we don't know, let me not say you, if we don't know who our target our target audience is, then how are we meeting the needs? So um, anyone else have thoughts about that? Um, I I do. Um, I think <laughs> I think our our target demographic, considering the area that we're in, um, would most likely be the Latino community, but I also believe it would be um, working professionals. And working more, more than likely working professionals with children. Mm -hmm. um, because from what I've seen in my years at Turner so far is that um, we tend to attract families and the children have something to do. The parents have something to do. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the time we tend to attract families and professional families at that no, that's that's good stuff. That's that's good stuff. So we have the international community. We have working professionals with children, the family units. Okay, so we're going to take all that and come back to it. We're we're just trying to build build this this puzzle together. So, what are some of Turner's assets? Because you have to align your assets and passions to the needs of now this international community and this working professional with children's community. So, what would you guys say some of Turner's assets are? Real question. I feel like I need to say that again. <laughs> well, I know I have said continually um, that one, uh, what I have observed to be one of Turner's assets is our collective response to, um, to a need. So giving to a need, like um, anytime there is something brought before the congregation that the kids need uniforms, they need school supplies, whatever the need is in the community, there's usually a very robust response to whatever the need is that's articulated. So the fact that Turner meets needs, that there's a, a, a response to a need in the community. That, that's one of our assets. Anyone else have thoughts about our assets? Because the next question is just gonna build upon that, you guys, if you haven't figured this out yet. So um, what, are, what are your guys' thoughts about Turner's assets? That's the, so let me just, for not, not to play anyone dumb, but assets, what does Turner do well? What are our strengths? I say warm worship. <laughs> Say that again, Mother. A warm worship. I think we had wonderful service. I think we are very, um, I don't want to say outgoing, very welcoming. Um, I think our service is very fulfilling. I think, I think warm worship, for lack of a better description. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I actually was going to say the same thing that Turner has a very inviting, um, okay, boy, <laughs> a very inviting atmosphere, and internally it is it's a it's a whole community, and just in the church, just not even what we do outside of Turner, inside of Turner is its own community. Okay, thank you, Nick, Candy. Oh. I, um, I think 
Go oh, ahead. go ahead, Reverend Williams. Oh, good. You got it. Okay, so I was going to say, I think um, we're very strategic in um, how the word is proclaimed and given. Um, our pastor, he's very um, um, purposeful in teaching God's word and not just headlines or um, whatever the new whatever he's really strategic and purposeful in making sure that um he is the shepherd and that he's teaching what god is leading him to give to the people and not like just whatever a, a fad might be or whatever the new and latest um internet preacher or tv preacher or you know whoever the the person of the the time is he's very st strategic and making sure that the other ministers and leaders within the church are strategic in what um we do and what we say and how we um lead and be disciples awesome thank you thank you ma'am thank you candace uh louine i'm gonna get robert williams first and then i'm gonna jump back to you is that cool all right i was gonna say um um our willingness to connect outside of our culture so we don't just stay, you know, within ourselves, within the, our cultural norms, but we're willing to connect with other culture, other ethnicity. Yeah, that, yeah, that word. I got it. Ethnicities, that's the word. Ethnicity, I'm yeah. And of course, um, make me forget. Across what? Uh, denominations. Across denominations as, as well. well. Okay. Thank you. To Reverend and Sister Inez Williams. Louine, Sister Louine. I think uh, one of our assets also is that we have a rich history of family. Like you can go through Turner and see from the beginning fam the family histories and 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 you know, like your family. And they, I think that um I think that um helps with um some consistencies with Turner also with traditions and things like that. Okay. Thank you, Louine. Uh, thank you everyone for your, um, your input and your, your contributions. So if we take kind of those three last questions that we had, and we're going to build this kind of together before we pivot to the other side of strategic planning and things of that nature. So aligning our strategic thinking to the vision includes um, expounding on or making sure we promote. I, I really the word I'm feeling like is it's not it's going to sound better, but it's not what I mean when I say it. And the word I'm thinking is exploiting, but it's strong, but it's not what I'm it, not in the negative connotation. But promoting, putting out front the fact that we have warm worship, we're welcoming. It's an inviting atmosphere. Our willingness to connect to outside cultures and ethnicities, our rich family history, um, the, the strategic work, preach word that goes forth, um, uh, the community atmosphere that we offer, using all of those different assets, promoting those different assets, putting those out front to make sure they are displayed so that we can meet the needs of the international community and the working professional community and those with children that when so kind of that's kind of what we just built here right now like so we have to when we're thinking about what we want to put forth and what we want to offer those are the different components we should make sure that we're incorporating so that it can align with our vision to attract those that can help promote and enhance our vision. Cool. So on the flip side of that is sometimes you have strategies and ministries that are no longer fulfilling the vision and the mission of the church. They Things have pivoted and things have shifted. And so what do we do with those ministries? What do we do with those strategies? What, what do we do with those different pieces of the puzzle? And so the author basically says there's a you start a process to bring it back in alignment with the vision. So there should be an evaluation process or an evaluation team that's not the pastor. And we say not the pastor. The author says not the pastor because it's 
it takes the weight off of his shoulders because when it's on the pastor, it's the pastor's fault. So you can take it away from the pastor. You have a process or a team that looks at the effectiveness of our ministries, of our offerings. And so if a ministry is not performing or aligning with the vision, um, I have three options. This is a multiple choice question. So everyone can participate, right? A multiple choice question. So I'm gonna give you the three options and then I'm gonna go back one at a time and I need you to throw up a symbol of what you think we should do with a ministry that is not performing or aligning with the vision. Basically it's stagnant, it's not producing fruit. It's, yeah, you guys get what I'm saying. I know you do, cause I can see it behind your names. So you can either throw it away you can get new leadership or you evaluate the need and take action. I think those are my three options. Okay. So again, you can throw it away, get rid of it, you know, blow taps on it and send it away in the sunset. You can get new leadership for that ministry, or you evaluate the overall effectiveness of the ministry, the overall leadership of the ministry, and then take action. So everyone good? Let me think about it. All right. Okay. So I see Nick's answer. She says the value. So if you think the thing is, if we have a ministry that is not performing and aligning with the vision and mission of the church, if you think the answer is throw it away, throw up a symbol. Okay, that's nobody. All right, praise the Lord. If you think it's get new leadership for the ministry, throw up something. Okay, or if you think the response is to evaluate the need and take action. Okay, I see a lot of evaluates. Um, okay, perfect. That that's that's kind of what the author says. But what Stop. does that look like? That's page two, Pastor. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so. You start a process to bring it back in alignment using that evaluation process or that evaluation team. Um, I'm sure I got everything on the page. Okay. There has to be, and this is what the author says, there has to be a purging and a cleansing and a revamping process. As we previously mentioned and we just dealt with, strategies are evolving and dynamic. And sometimes it may not be create a whole new ministry, but changing the focuses within that ministry. And we see that with, with our missionary society. They 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 serve the people. That's their overall goal. They serve the people. But they when things shifted from how we served warm nights, and I, I can speak of what I know. I can't speak of what I don't know. When we shifted from warm nights, we shifted to, you know, providing funds where they were, you know, and we shifted to the food distribution. You have to, you can't just continue to say, well, we're going to continue Regardless, if they come, we're going to continue to open our church every week in the month of December to welcome. But if they don't come, what's the purpose in opening the church? You have to shift your strategy to meet the needs of what is being, what the community is asking for. So the author states, and I quote, too many churches have a lot of little separate ministries that are good, but do not align with the mission. They may not look like they're hurting anything, but they take up the needed time, space, and energy, and thus lessen our ability to achieve the overall purpose in growing our church. So that kind of hit me a little bit, right? Because if we, and I don't necessarily think this is um, a turn of issue because we've gone through some purging processes over the years. We've went from moving our clubs and minish, clubs and auxiliaries to ministries. And then we went from making sure our ministry shifted their focus from inwardly to outwardly focus, right? But when you have a lot of small ministries that are using resources, it burns people out. And we've, we've heard it time and time again, the laborers are few, but the harvest is great. Or y'all know the saying, I probably jacked that up, but you know what I'm saying? So if you have small ministries that are using the resources of our people, of our time, but we're not receiving anything from them, we are burning people out with no, re no reward. Y'all know, I'm gonna just say how it comes to me, with no reward. So we have to make sure that all of our ministries, all of our focuses, all of our strategies, all of our activities are aligned with the vision and the ministry. Specifically said, so when we go to that evaluation process, Pastor, he said, healthy churches 
decide who can sit on that evaluation group and they trust that group to make the decision as to how to move forward with the ministry if it's not performing. And for me, the key word in that whole sentence was the big T word, and that is trust. They trust that group. They have faith in that group to evaluate the ministry to determine how to get it back and aligned with the vision. So question again, real question, who should make up that group? In the AME system, I think that would be the Board of Stewards. Okay, that's one answer. All right, yeah. thank you, Reverend Williams. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I So, okay, I got a two-part answer. Um, thinking in terms of the AME system, like Reverend Williams referenced, I, my first thought was the Board of Stewards or like... I don't think we function in this way, but like the commissioners, like the commissioner system, even though I was never really a fan of the commissioner system, but I mean, in theory, it works. Um, but I would also say a cross section of the church leadership and membership. So that would include um, stewards, trustees, um, ministry leaders, you know, just sort of how, um, the official board represents a cross section of the church, maybe a, a makeup like that on a smaller scale. No, thank you, Dr. Gatson. Um, thank you for your answer. I appreciate that. Uh, Candy, Candace? Um, I kind of agree with um, what Dr. Gatson was saying, but even you need people who maybe not are in that leadership role, but people who have stake and what's important. So like regular members, um, maybe somebody from each generation because each of them have something to share or to give because they each have a, a perspective um, and not just leadership because some of us as leaders, we're looking at a bird's eye view where somebody from the pew might have a different perspective and uh, um could give a little bit more meat to how to make the transition happen. Awesome, thank you, Candy. So, kind of what what I I'm a, I'm a in align with what was been said, and I think it came from the book, but I'm gonna just take credit for it because I wrote it. It should be a solid representation of the body to do the research and present the findings to the pastor and, and leadership, because ultimately you do not want people to feel excluded or that their voices aren't heard. But, but, aha, uh -huh, like in coming to America, the processes, the movements, the momentum cannot be stalled by, um, and I, I really struggle for what to call people who stall stuff. So I'm gonna just say like the special teams, and I don't mean special like that, but I mean like the football team, like not the offense or the defense, but the special teams who comes out, you know, just every now and then. So it cannot be, the momentum cannot be stalled by the, the special teams. Um, so, and then one thing he said also that kind of struck out to me is, do not be held by the niceness culture of the church. Sometimes you have to make decisions that are good for the organization, but not good for the individual. And big decisions require lots of holy conversations. And that was like, that 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 spoke to my heart because that's kind of where I live. But you have to, sometimes we have to look at, and, and the goal is not to hurt people's feelings. That's never the goal, but it's for the good of the body, but you have to coach it in holy conversations or as he called it, holy conferencing. So I'm gonna just deal with this really quickly. I found this eight principles of holy conferencing. So that is when you're having those tough conversations with people, um, some things to keep in mind, especially as we talk to people in the body of Christ. So we don't, um, so we, we make sure it's covered right? We make sure it's covered. That's that's my way of saying it. So eight principles in holy conferencing. When you're talking to somebody and you want to um, coach it in, in the holy conversations and holy conferences, every, just remember everyone 
Every person is a child of God, point one. Listen before speaking. These could probably help us in just our everyday conversations with people too. Listen before speaking. Strive to understand from another's point of view. Strive to reflect accurately the views of others. Disagree without being disagreeable. Speak about issues and do not make it personal. Pray in silence or aloud, but pray before your decisions. And then I put a sub note for myself. Don't use your prayer as a weapon because we know we could be in some situations and someone start talking crazy. And we just start, Lord, you better help them before I get to them. That's not what they talking about. Pray in silence or aloud before you make decisions and let prayer interrupt your busyness. So those are eight principles I found as it dealt with having holy conversations and holy conferencing. If we implore those, it will make having those tougher conversations a little bit better instead of people feeling like they're being attacked. Okay, perfect. Um, ministries and strategies must serve and meet needs. Not all decisions will be successful, but if they execute with excellence and it doesn't work, which is possible, it might not work. We done did all this planning and we thought we done got it and we done figured it out and it still don't work. Learn from it, apply it and move on. This can be due to this is not the right time, it's not the right place, it's not the right audience. And the author specifically says the mission field will tell you whether or not you made the right decision. Input should also come, as we said, from the outside community as exactly what pastor said from the outside community in, and we learn from that and grow from that. And I think Dr. Gatson said earlier, cause they, as Jarrell said, be in my notes. Um, this, the church is not a social club. And I got that from want somebody on this call and I won't quote them, but the church is not a social club. Like if you need a social club, there, there are social clubs, but the church is not a social club, but we are called to meet needs and reflecting. This is a real question on what we learned about people seeking friendships and relationships through the church, how do we bridge that gap in via the strategic planning of our events and outreach? So we don't wanna be a social club, but people come to church to seek relationships and friendships. So we gotta find a way to bring those pieces together. And how can we do that through our strategic planning of our events and outreach? Discipleship. <laughs> discipleship because quite frankly and I remember teaching this a long time ago early in ministry that in generally speaking I'm at I, I am at the same level of relationship with a lot of members of the church that I am with per, uh, perfect strangers right could you see somebody and you say good morning you see them Sunday morning but they not at your Thanksgiving table right but the connection that you have is that you have proclaimed yourselves to be followers of Christ and that automatically joins you together. And so you can meet friends in the, in the street. You know, you can go to um, a social gathering and gain new friendships, but these relationships that we are supposed to be gaining in the house are supposed to have a different foundation and that foundation is our faith. And so I think discipleship bridges the gap between social club and also still needing to establish those relationships. And I know it sounds very, you know, trite and general, but what I mean by that is if I meet Shandell Ivy at a sorority meeting, then I'm like, girl, <laughs> when are we going to hit up this <laughs> gathering? But if I meet Shandell Ivy at Turner, when um, crisis hits my life, I'm not calling Shandell Ivy to find out when we can hang. I'm calling Shandell Ivy to see if she can pray for me because this is what's going on in my life. I want to know what does discipleship look like you, when you use the term discipleship what 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 is that I think of exactly how it was for me when I was um coming back to church as an adult and as a new believer when I came in the community of faith embraced me they helped me to discover my gifts 
and in our interactions and in our conversations, I learned more about God. I learned more about the scriptures, um, even in our um, girlfriend time and our um, like circle of love, which was our women's Bible study or whatever. Yeah, we talked about things that women, new wives, mothers, whomever go through, but it was grounded in the word and in our faith. And so at that time, crisis was hitting my life. And that's, you know, how I got to know um, Reverend King, Inter, you know, Shandell and Pastor Kearney know my girlfriend, um, Reverend Raylan King, Inter. but she, start, she started out by, before she became my girlfriend, she was more of a spiritual mentor and helped to um, disciple me, helped me to grow in my faith, prayed with me, gave me godly counsel when I was trying to figure out what decisions I needed to make in my life and um, helped me to have like that whole circle helped me to have a real understanding of the word and apply it to my life. So that's what I think about when I, when I say discipleship, that's specifically what I'm thinking of. So how do you, how, 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 let's see, how do you, um, contend, handle when there are persons who will have every conversation with you except a spiritual conversation or a biblical conversation because they are, they possibly have the mindset, well, I don't want to be, a, you know, uh, holier than thou, or I don't want to be uh, over, you know, overzealous Jesus lover, or uh, beat someone with the with the word because you share with those individuals in the midst of conversing with you, they they grounded their conversation, um, if you will, you know, scriptural, biblical, spiritual type of thing. So, how do you contend with uh, people who will have? Every kind don't mind having conversations, but but won't talk to you about Jesus. I think, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, I think that kind of goes back to what we talked about last week with with the whole uh, Jarrell thing of it, and that's like you have to meet people where you are and where they where they are, and then it's just having those. And I, the, I'm not saying wear them down, but having those conversations about your experiences and dropping those nuggets in there as you have those conversations with them about, you know, um, kind of like what we did with the testimonies, the testimonies last week, you know, dropping in it like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm just so grateful that God blessed me with this and not saying, well, you know, in the Bible, it says you have to you have to know where people are. This is yeah, where, where they are to have those conversations at a level where 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 they where they are um you know they say you talk to people how how you know they'll receive it so i wouldn't come and you know say hey we gotta have we gotta open the bible right now and things like i'm gonna just talk about personal experiences of how god has moved in my life and things i know firsthand um and then hopefully it starts chipping at walls so they come become more comfortable to then reciprocate that's me i wasn't sure if that question was for me but hey <laughs> yeah that's it that's it i i listen everything she said because i want to make sure that um i qualify what i just said and that is when when these women embraced me and surrounded me and um talked with me they grounded everything they said in scripture but they didn't pull out and say okay so in the third chapter of the gospel according to luke you know, I knew scripture by the conversation before I knew where it was or even that it was scripture. They were teaching me principles for my life. And then as I grew, I was like, okay, I know I can um, find this here, you know? So it's it's everything. Um, if you watch The Office, what she said. <laughs> That's that's good stuff. Good stuff. So one last um, 
Oh, are you done, Pastor? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, one last um thing to deal with, one last point to deal with is so we talked about making sure, you know, our outreach or our activities meet needs and uh are aligned with the vision and are strategically planned and things of that nature. But what does it mean to meet needs? What does that, what, how do we know we're meeting needs? What does that mean? That's a real question. I think you're only going to meet the needs based upon the response back of the individual. Like you can't base it upon what you think you're doing because you can be like, oh yeah, I'm doing the greatest thing ever. And you're just going downhill real quick. If they, if the response is positive and it's it's warm coming back from the individual and they're you know reciprocating and you and you know you're opening a dialogue or, or something like that. I think you'll know that it's it's getting to the point of possibly meeting their needs. Awesome. Thanks I think it's I think it's difficult to meet needs if we don't have conversation with people so that so that so that we can be informed or 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 use discernment um, to see what the needs are um, instead of us as a church assuming that folks need food. Hey, they may not need food, but they may need gas cards. <laughs> you, you know, and so here we are. I'm this is just an example. It's, it's just an example. Or, you know, so here we are thinking we're doing a service to the community when in all actuality, it would be something totally different. So I think it's dangerous for us as a community of faith to look at a community and then say, okay, they need X, Y, and Z without going into the area and actually having dialogue with individuals and then coming back and saying, okay, in this conversation, I discovered this. So maybe we can do X, Y, and Z. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Joey. So so kind of building on that, what Pastor said and what and what Joey said. So what does outreach look like? Because outreach is not just serving the needy. What what does outreach look like? Okay, so so oh, oh, okay, I was gonna, I was gonna, <laughs> Thanks, um, outreach is to me, outreach is the bridge between you and from point A to point B. Outreach is trying to, and and, and the only reason why I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking about this is because I'm part of outreach for Morgan, um, and we're trying to like meet, you know, reach out to you know the. The kids in Morgan State University, you know, like for instance, with you know, said issue that happened, like we're going to be going up there soon. We're trying to meet the, I'm trying to meet an emotional needs and let them know, like we're we're there. I'm just using it as an example that there are people here for you, that there are people that care about you, that love you, and that hey, you know, if if you you know you need somebody to talk to, that they're that you're surrounded by people that love you, and we're just trying to make trying to bridge that gap from. You know, with this incident that's hap that happened to when they get ready down the line and graduate, like, hey, there's still a family down here that you can come to. So I kind of, and, and like in church terms, I think, you know, you're still trying to bridge that gap from if somebody's trying to look for the Lord and you're trying to, you know, invite them to the house, let them know the house, the door's always open, you're not forcing them, but hey, we're always here for you. And if they do come in, then hey, we'll just, we, we got open arms for you. So that, my quick synopsis. No, thank you, Joey. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So kind of building on what Joey just said, the definition that I found online of outreach is outreach is the activity of providing services to any population that might not otherwise have access to those services. A key component of outreach is that the group providing it is not stationary, but mobile. In other words, it involves meeting someone in the need of an outreach service where they are. Sometimes it cannot be done in the comforts of our safe space within the walls. It means going out, taking what we're offering to those who are seeking it. And the key word is out. So outside, out, outreach. Okay. 
Okay, so this is discipleship classes, Bible study. So we could we have a scripture we're gonna look at really quickly, and then um I will be done. So uh if we can open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 through 15. And if anybody would love to volunteer to read it, I would be grateful. Don't all start at once. That's second, for those that didn't hear me, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 through 15. I got you. Thank you, Joey. I'm going to give you a something. I'm going to pay Joey. <laughs> All right, second, second Corinthians uh, chapter 9, 10 through 15, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So, Two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God. For your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift too, wonderful four wonderful four words thank you thank you joey and so just as i wrap this up we talked about meeting needs we talked about strategically aligning our vision and our our vision to um to the community our assets and our passions to meet needs this scripture to me kind of highlighted and gave some benefits of meeting needs and of outreach. And these are things we should, you know, embody when we're out meeting needs and just think of, you know, it's it's always good to meet needs. We want to make sure it's done. Um, like, like pastor mentioned, we're making sure it's done and it's a benefit of the community we're serving, not just because we feel like that's what they want, but the benefits that I, that I glean from this is, is four benefits really quickly. Um, when we do outreach and we meet needs. We supply the needs of the saints or of the community. There's thanksgivings given to God. It's our obedience to God. And in turn, it's prayers that that community then offers to God for you. So, and, and, and I quote pastor a lot, but he says a lot. And one thing he said, and that's not being shady. Um, one thing that he says is, you know, especially when we're out doing food distribution and, it, and it's difficult, but like, we got to make sure that the community sees the God in us. We might not be able to communicate that always, but they should see the God in us and the Jesus in us. And that that's proof of God's love, his agape love. So when we meet needs and we provide outreach that's of service, that's strategically aligned with our vision, you know, people should see the God in us. They should see the Jesus in us. And we should be a living proof of God's agape love. Pastor, that's it. I um let me uh, before I express uh, uh many thanks um to this and and I think Sunday is the fourth Sunday of this month and I think you have a text and a message um that text Second Corinthians chapter nine really encompasses the thing that I oftentimes say and I think I've even heard Joey say it during my tenure at Turner and maybe some others. And I have always said it that the Lord blesses you so you can be a blessing to others. And I think this passage of scripture um, embodies, embodies that. Um, it is, you know, in talking about strategy and evaluating, I think all of us are aware that uh, for the most part, we really have an evaluation tool. It's called the MPA, the Ministry Plan of Action. And one of the questions that each ministry team um, leader is often asked is, did the ministry achieve 
and, and, and maybe not these exact words, but I'm paraphrasing because I kind of developed the form. But did the ministry area achieve its purpose last conference year? Is, is this ministry in line? How, would, how does this ministry or this particular program or this particular event uh, line up with the mission and vision of Turner? How, are y'all familiar with those questions? Please show some form of sign. So Reverend Gadsden, what do you do when you get a form back and um, and it doesn't line up? I have an answer. It, you send it to the evaluation team because <laughs> everyone on here just said evaluate. You send it to the evaluation team for them to evaluate the need and take action and get it back in line with the vision. And, you know, honestly speaking, and, and of course, we talked about the evaluation team being a cross section of the congregation and, and what that should be. But it uh, but I, and, and um, if we are honest, the senior staff, we have had to operate as the evaluation team, particularly in times and spaces where the ministry itself did not, and I'm not speaking of any ministry in particular, you know, because we are having a conversation about ultimately fulfilling the mission um, that um, Christ called us to as a, as a um, worshiping body. Um, but particularly when the ministry um, I guess operates with blinders on in that just as the author talked about where the initiative might be in and of itself a good initiative but not necessarily line up with the articulated vision and mission of Turner as articulated by our pastor. So we've had to collectively be the evaluation team and ask the questions of, okay, and go back to those questions. Well, ha have we, you know, and, and but what, what I want to say publicly <laughs> is that it is infinitely more helpful if the ministry itself will engage in that kind of evaluation Absolutely. before Absolutely. it gets to any evaluation team, Absolutely. right? And we and and every every ministry should be equipped to be able to do that, you know, by virtue of the fact that your ministry leader is appointed and put in place. That means that that person has the capacity to at least um, start the ball rolling on that. I myself am available to help every ministry. And, and we tried to go in that vein prior to the pandemic, and we know the pandemic kind of cut things off, but the mid, um, sort of mid-year conversation was a gentle nudge like, hey, you might want to get with your team and see if you are kind of trekking in the right space. But now we're having a very frank and honest discussion about it. It is definitely helpful for every ministry to be able to engage in that kind of reflection. Um, do you know, if you want to call it a plus Delta, call it a plus Delta. If you want to call it, you know, whatever term you want to give to it, yeah. but to engage in a process before it gets to any evaluation team, because if you can come and say, we did this and, but we, we need work on that. That's a lot easier than, an outside team saying this didn't work. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Does someone else have a response? I, I... Okay. Uh, hey, I think, um, let me thank Sister Shandell for an excellent job in uh, this um, instruction on tonight. I, I really do hope 
uh, that not only this conversation, but I think I'm, I really do pray and hope that every single conversation uh, that has been that has taken place and tonight that it will really seep into the 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 deep recesses of your soul and 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 and, and your spirit um because you know it, it, because it's so much it's 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 so needed right it's so needed and even when a church decides to relocate there really should be a study in the area where you're wanting to relocate to make sure that the church's assets, as Sister Shandell used, matches, if you will, the needs of that community. I think I said something, right? Um, and or or sometimes the Lord may say, may lead you to a new venture, you know, new territory, a new ministry opportunity, uh, because it is something that has never been done before, but he has blessed you uh, to be the catalyst to make it happen. Now, I tell you this, uh, Sister Moore, Dr. Sewell, uh, Sister Helen, that no church within the Washington Conference within the second Episcopal district. And I, I, I don't want to say internationally because I don't know where every church is located um, internationally, but does not have, cannot lay hold of the claim that they sit in the middle of a international cultural melting pot where they have opportunity to create a revelation chapter uh, 19, where John beholds Saul, a great multitude that cannot be number of every nation, tribe, and language gathered together there around the throne. No other church can lay hold of that claim. And here we are at Turner, where we sit in an international cultural melting pot, where we have opportunity to provide ministry, to provide opportunity, not just for uh, the Latino population, but for the Caribbean, the African, the, uh, the, the South America, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and many of which are members and they may be one or two, but they are they are members of Turner. And that we can be the leading example of what kingdom really looks like here on earth. Because our communities are changing and shifting. So I, I, I want us to, um, I appreciate it. Thank you so very much, um, Sister Shandell. We're looking forward next week. Um, Hallelujah. Next week, next week, we will be in chapter number seven, uh, dealing with staffing for leadership in my doctoral class. And I think many of you, um, I don't know, sis, and let me not call any names. If um, you all remember the book, um, I don't even think I mentioned it, but it's a book that's entitled Moving from Good to Great something of that nature, moving from good to great. And in this particular book, the author uh, states, Dr. Gatson, that, and uses the analogy of the bus and the bus being the church going in a specific direction. If the right people are not in the right seats, you're gonna have an accident. So how do you get the right people on the bus and how do you get them in the right seat so that the bus can go forward? Because having folks, having the wrong people on the bus and folks in the wrong seat, because as Sister Shandell brought up earlier, is dealing with, uh, with, with the options. 
sometimes is there, do we need a shift in leadership in, 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 or, or, you know, the evaluation and stuff of, you know, all of those, all, and it, would, it would, all of those, all of those particular options, right? Because sometimes an individual in a position for 30, 40 years may be a detriment more than a blessing. Dr. Gadsden, could you close us out in a word of prayer? Absolutely. Let us look to the Lord. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, for this time of sharing, discussion, exploration, learning, um, even struggle and wrestling with concepts and ideas and our own thoughts and perspectives. We thank you, God, for nudging us, pushing us, challenging us to rethink how we approach ministry. God, we pray, we thank you for the move of your Holy Spirit, even as we offered our perspectives and shared our thoughts. And God, we pray that what we have shared here tonight would be seated deep in our hearts and that we would continue to turn over these concepts and ideas, continue to listen for your voice as you direct us in the work that we you have put our hands to. God, we pray that you would continue to lead our pastor and, um, and strengthen him to lead us so that we can walk in the mandate that you have put on our lives collectively and individually. God, we pray that uh, we lift up every household represented here. We pray that you would continue to be a hedge of protection around each one of them so that tomorrow when the sun rises, we can get up, give you the glory and be strengthened and prepared to do the work and walk in that which you have called us to do. God, we thank you. We thank you for calling us, not because of, but in spite of. And God, we just pray that you would continue us to continue to strengthen us and bind us together in your love by the power of your spirit so that we could do what you called us to do. We thank you, God, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, our souls collectively declare, amen. Amen. Before, and, and you're not, I'm committing a sin because nothing should be said after prayer. Um, I, if it is, if any person is of interest of this, I'm wanting to share this with you. Um, next, um, um, Sister Moore, next semester, I'm teaching a class, um, how to think theologically. Um, and it's, it's based upon this particular book. It's, it, the book is actually entitled How to Think Theologically. And I know many of us dealing with our conversation, our Jesus talk, understanding Bible, understanding scripture. Um, I have not had a thorough opportunity yet to go through this book from cover to cover, but I'm putting it out there it's how to think theologically for those persons who are wanting to grow um, in that particular area. Uh, it's the third edition. That's the most you, you want to get the third edition, how to think theologically. It's a, it's a little deep. I'm going to be doing this next semester. But however, I'm welcoming and encouraging you, uh, my Turner members, uh, to get the book to take part of it. Uh, so that, um, yeah, so, so if it's going to, if so that it hopefully will be a benefit, uh, to you as you continue to grow and develop, as we continue to grow and develop within our spiritual, in our spiritual walk. Um, but that's it. Y'all have a good night. God bless you. Hey, I look forward to seeing you all Wednesday in the house. All right. Have a good evening. Peace and blessings.